Thank you so much, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. But the first question I have for you is, who knows what an anthropologist is? Right? So people always mistake me for Indiana Jones. I'm not sure why, because I don't look anything like Harrison Ford. But anthropologists come in all kinds of forms. And one of them is archaeology. But my doctorate is in cultural anthropology. So I study behavior across cultures. So here at the Luruvo Center, I'm fortunate because I get to apply my anthropology to build systems, to work with people, and to talk about brain health, particularly as it applies cross-culturally. So I'm really excited today to share it with you. Um, the session might be a little bit different than others. I prefer an interactive session. We're going to hold the questions till the end. But if you've got something that you're dying to say right in the middle, please say it. I'd rather have it be interactive and we'll share together, right? But before we begin, I have to ask you guys, did you hear the, the story? There was a, the brain who walked into the bar, and he said to the bartender, I'll have a drink, please. And the bartender said, oh, no, I can't serve you. And the poor brain said, but why not? He said, because you're already out of your head. I can't serve you. <laughs> so you will get bad jokes today. Um, but what you really will get is a whole lot of focus, not so much on the pathology of the disease, but more about the health. So we'll learn today about the things you can do to stay healthy, that give you some tips on, on, the, on the six pillars of brain health. And maybe you'll learn a little bit about your brain and maybe a little bit about yourself. So let's begin. Um, I remember my mom always said to me, just wait until you're my age. And why did she say that? She said, because then you're going to forget it, what it was like to be your age. And, and I say that to myself all the time. And I find myself looking in the mirror, and I see my mother's face, and I open up my mouth, and I hear my mother's words, and it's always about age. And I think back to myself, what's happened? What are all these experiences? My parents were great. It was ballet lessons from the time I was four. It was education. It was the pediatrician. And all of these experiences came together to create what's now my brain. So if you think back, and every time you glance in the mirror and you see your mom, just remember to say thank you, because she helped build that brain. And I haven't forgotten what it was like to be that age. And one of the things I want you to remember today is we're going to go back to that age, and what's important is having fun and enjoying it and letting your brain grow. So your brain is incredible. And I want to talk about how it really does control every aspect of your life. The way you move, I'm Italian, so the way my arms move, the memories it creates, the emotions that you get, when you cry, when you laugh, everything. Your brain is working tirelessly for you. It's even working when you're asleep. And as my teenage son would say, my brain is awesome. And for most of you, at least for me, my brain is awesome until I have to take a test or until I fall in love, and then clearly my brain just stops functioning. But it controls everything about us, right? It's a pretty amazing organ, and it works all the time. It's complex. It's a computer. In fact, if you could, and we're not doing zombie movies today, but if you could plug a light bulb into a brain, in fact, it would generate enough electricity to light that light bulb. That's pretty incredible, right? Our brains are unbelievably great computers. It's, it weighs about three pounds. And it's, I guess for most of us, that's about 2% of our body. But it, it, here's what's really great. It has a billion neurons. I had to look it up because I'm an anthropologist, not a mathematician. And I had to look up and figure out, how many zeros is that exactly? Well, that's nine zeros, right? And five trillion synapses, five trillion connections, 12 zeros, and 70,000 thoughts per day. That's a pretty strong computer, if you ask me, and one that we should be pretty delighted to take care of, right? So let's take a look at this super powerful computer. This computer allows you to do everything. How many of you can still, I can, I can sometimes balance on one foot, not often. 
but unless I get to yoga. But it lets you also remember your anniversary for the guys in the crowd. Um, remember your anniversary, it lets you work, it lets you read, it even lets you, like me, tell really bad jokes. Your brain really works over time. But most importantly, and the thing we're going to focus on today, is that your brain is resilient. And scientists used to think that your brain kind of grew and at adulthood it was over, right? But what we have learned with time is that your brain will continue to change through life. Even while you're here, while you're listening to me, you're generating new brain cells, new neurons. You're creating new networks, what we call new neural pathways into your brain. New ways, you're making new memories right here. You know, you're meeting new people, you're interacting, you're listening, you're educating. And what we have found is that the more you stimulate your brain, the more experiences you have, the more brain cells you can create, and all the more connections you can make. So your brain just doesn't stop working. Your brain keeps going. And in fact, this idea, we call it neuroplasticity. A big word for meaning that it's resilient. But it, this notion of neuroplasticity and the fact that your brain will still continue to grow has really revolutionized the way we think about our brains because it's forced us to talk to groups like this and encourage you to change and encourage you to keep learning and encourage you to, to continue both your education as well as new experiences. I, I'm always reminded of the story. Who's, has anybody been to London? Okay. Are those not the craziest streets in the world, right? And we think our cabbies are crazy. There is nothing like London except maybe Florence. But, but the streets of London are nothing like ours. I get confused when whether or not Cimarron goes all the way through from Flamingo to wherever. These cabbies have to figure out 25,000 streets. They have to know thousands and thousands of monuments. We just have to find the Luxor across from the MGM, right? But, oh, and you guys in Elko, I'm not sure how many streets you have, but, but I'm thinking that it's probably not 25,000. I haven't been to Elko lately, but what happened was they realized some scientists in, in London said, let's do a study of London taxi drivers. Let's see what's going on with their brains. First of all, how interesting is that idea, right? That I'm going to talk to taxi drivers and look what's happening. And the reason they did that is because taxi drivers in London have to complete a test that's called the knowledge. And you kind of rise through the ranks and get certified as a cabbie in London by learning the knowledge. And the knowledge is you've got to know all these 25,000 streets and you've got to know all the different ways to get around the capital. And so it's a very, very rigorous test. And the scientists did MRI scans of the brains of these cabbies before they started practicing. And then as they went through the ranks learning about the knowledge, at the end, they studied it again. And only an elite few actually passed this, because you can imagine how crazy it is, right? And what they found was the brain parts that were linked to memory actually grew. So as they passed this knowledge and they found that as they continued to learn these, that in fact, their brains expanded. They had better memories. So by learning all these you know, sort of spaghetti streets, look at these, that you could actually structurally change your brain through this experience. And for me, I thought, my gosh, this is an incredible example of the kinds of things we can do. Now, I don't know about Uber drivers or where that's going to go here in Las Vegas, but I know 25,000 streets in London could help you grow. So I am not a London cabbie driver, and I am not going to ask you to memorize all the streets in Vegas, but I am going to ask you to look at and work with me on making our brains work a little bit. So I am a bit of a workaholic, right? And, <laughs> and so what I need your help with today is to help me build my grocery list. And I'm trying to follow my own advice, so I'm going to cook crispy skin salmon tonight. So I need you guys to help me remember my grocery list so when I leave today, I can remember what it is I have to buy when I leave, okay? So doesn't this look delicious? Well, the good news is that there's only actually five ingredients. So it's easy for us workaholics. i got to get in, got to get it done. So here's what they are, you guys. Salmon, butter, no cheating and writing it down. Salmon, butter, lemon, Dijon mustard, and some tarragon leaves. Because, you see, the older I get, I have trouble remembering these things. And now I have to make lists of everything, including five ingredient recipes. How crazy is that? But the good news is you guys are getting older right along with me. 
And the good news also is that we're getting older, right? So the age of longevity, what we think of here as the age of longevity, has actually arrived. I remember as an early anthropologist studying the ancient Greeks, and they lived until this ripe old age of 28, right? Well, old age now, as you look across these countries, 82. Average longevity in Japan, 82 from the time of birth, right? The US, our average age is about 80, except DC. I had to throw this in because this is a political year. Except in DC, which is the lowest longevity rate in the country at 72. I don't know what those politicians are doing. But when you start looking at these, people are living much, much longer than they used to. And if you look at the age groups, the centenarians, the people who live to 100, they're the fastest growing age group in the world. That's pretty incredible to me. And ladies, I see we're outnumbering the men in here. We also outnumber the men as, as centenarians, too. And super centenarians, that's at 110. People who live beyond 110. There are actually 100 that we can identify now. And this population is continuing to grow. So think about this aging population and how we're growing together. Here in the US, in, in 2013, there were about 41 million Americans who were 65 and older. But the boomers are coming along. And by 2030, 20% of Americans will be 65 or older. So what's that mean to us? And why, is, why am I setting the stage for all these numbers and all this stuff about aging? Well, our brains age too. And what happens to your, age, your brain when it ages? Well, there's a couple of things going on. It slows down, as you can tell by my need to have all this help in this room for a grocery list. But it starts to slow down. It also starts to shrink in size, and it's less able to adapt to change. And when all these things come together, it makes it a little bit more vulnerable to brain disease. So it's very important knowing that we have an aging population, knowing that our brains are affected by growing old, that we look at what we can do to take care of our brains, right? So what's going on? Obviously, if people are living to 82, how are they doing that? Well, we're living much healthier lives overall than the ancient Greeks did at 28. We don't get thrown into the Colosseum, or was that the Romans? I can't recall. But we live a whole lot longer, and our lives are a whole lot better. And what happens is our joints, our hearts, our other organs, our bodies can actually outlive our brain. And the way that we talk about it here at the Cleveland Clinic is that your lifespan could actually be longer than your brain span. So you step back and just think about that for a minute, right? We're eating healthy apples and salads and taking care of our lives. But what are we doing to take care of our brain? We really don't think about it. It's kind of, isn't that, isn't that an oxymoron, right? We really don't think about taking care of our brain. But how can we create this lifespan to match our brain span? Well, I like to think about it as kind of revving it up, right? It is a computer, and it is all exciting. So how do you rev it up? You guys, it's so much fun to take care of your brain. It's not like you have to go get shots or anything crazy. You can tune up your brain by, in, by engaging in social activities. Today, you're all tuning, we're all tuning up our brains. Um, I don't know about me so much, but you're definitely tuning up your brains. And, and also by being a little more physically active, challenging ourselves mentally, and having a really positive attitude and lifestyle and outlook on life. I, I would love to stand up here and tell you there's a magic pill. I get emails about magic pills for brain health all the time. They go directly to spam. There, there is no magic pill. Nothing that's going to you know, really take care of it. But you own it. You can do it. You can kickstart all of these and take all of these positive steps. So you can take a brisk walk. You can do physical activities. You can garden. I can't garden. It always dies. You can garden and nourish your brain at the same time. Because the fitter you are, the healthier your brain is. And if you decide that you're going to go for a walk, but you're going to go for a walk with a friend, all the better. In fact, I'm going to tell a story. Um, I, I, sadly, I lost my mom a couple months ago. But we found out that red wine is really good for your brain. So working at the Ruvo Center, I learned a glass of red wine a night is really good for my brain. And so is walking. And so is socializing. So what do you think my mom and I did every night? We poured a glass of red wine each, we took a walk, and we talked. And I thought, boy, this is great. I'm really working hard on my brain. So anybody who wants to go on my red wine walks, uh, give me a call. I don't have anybody to do it <laughs> anymore. But, but you came here to answer this question, right? What can I do to keep my brain healthy? 
So what do you think you've learned so far? Well, there's a couple of things, right? What you can do is learn that there are things that you can control and things that you cannot control. So aging, genetics, sex, I'm sorry, gender, all of those things are outside of your control. You can't change your gender. You can't change your genetics. You can't change your age, right? You can't do all of that. But lifestyle plays almost 60% in the health of your brain. And we can all change that. So how much you eat and drink? Um, how much exercise you get? Do you sleep? Are you stressed? How do you socialize? Do you hang out with friends? Do you have hobbies? If you're on high blood pressure medications, do you do them? Do you take them religiously? All of those decisions are so important to your brain health. They make all the difference in the world. And at the Cleveland Clinic, what we have done is offer you basically two, um, two, two guidelines. One of them, I think you actually have both of them here and in the remote locations, but one of them is called the Six Pillars of Brain Health Guide, and the other one is this new online system that we're gonna talk about in a minute called healthybrains.org where you can actually get a brain checkup. But I'm gonna start with the Six Pillars of Brain Health because they're pretty fundamental. So these six pillars were developed by Dr. Jeff Cummings and Dr. Kate Zong, and they talk about the underpinnings of brain health and adhering to these. They are food and nutrition, physical exercise, mental fitness, medical health, sleep and relaxation, and social interaction. None of those sound terribly onerous, right? Think you could make some decisions around them and take care of them, right? So the biggest contributor to this is physical exercise. E, my least favorite, I'm gonna admit. But physical exercise, if you focus on physical exercise, it's the biggest contributor. What's good for your body really is good for your brain. So this doesn't mean that we have to all run out and get a gym membership over you know, at David Barton or something. Again, don't have to go to the Las Vegas, I don't even know the name of the place. The Las Athletic, Athletic Club, thank you. See how bad I am with physical exercise? I can walk and drink wine and that's about the extent of it, right? But physical exercise is so important, but you can start your exercise re regime very, very simply. Okay. What's so good about it? Well, gosh, physical exercise does a lot of really good things for you. It can lower your risk for Alzheimer's disease, which we all wanna do, right? But it also improves, improves your blood flow. It improves your memory. It stimulates all these great endorphins and chemical changes in your brain that help you feel good and have a positive attitude. They also contribute to learning. It helps to improve your memory along the way and the way you think. And when, I, when I'm really good about it, exercise can actually reduce your stress. So think about all the good reasons to, to exercise. You even sleep better if you exercise, right? But there are four different kinds, according to the six pillars, there's four different kinds of exercise. So it's not good enough for me to just walk and drink red wine, right? Or for any of you. Because you also have to focus on aerobic exercise. So one of the first types of exercise is aerobic. And you should do this exercises about 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and then they tell you to aim for this target heart rate. And here's how you calculate your target heart rate. 220 minus your age times 80%. Now, if you can do that in your brain, you're teaching class next week, right? But it's an important number to keep in mind. But it also doesn't mean you have to do something crazy like run out and become a jogger, right? It also doesn't mean that you just need to go and walk like I do, but you could go dancing. You could um, walk briskly. You could go to the park. You could walk your dog. As long as you're getting your heart rate up there, and as long as you're hitting that target for about 30 minutes a day, you're improving your brain health. So I have this crazy chihuahua, worst, craziest dog in the world. He loves only me. But if I get him out on a leash, he's got my heart rate going to whatever that target is immediately because he's running and chasing everything. Aerobics are good. It's a good thing for you. You also need to build strength, though. And strength, lifting weights and doing resistance bands, that's just not for bodybuilders, right? It helps us build our muscle, and it helps us strengthen our bones. And as we age, those are two very important criteria for us to focus on. So you need to do some strength training two to three times a week. 
Now, I will exercise my legs. I don't care. My arms are a mess. That muscle group just doesn't want to do anything. But it's important that you exercise every one of your muscle groups. So it's not good enough to just do one and ignore the rest because you have to, you have to treat your body as a whole. Right? The third type of exercise is flexibility. We, we lose this as we get older. I don't know. Do you guys feel like you're losing your flexibility? Can no longer like kick way up here, ladies, or whatever? Right. It, it, it declines with age, so you just become less flexible. And if you focus on flexibility, so it's your third piece of all your physical exercise, and only do 10 minutes, 10 minutes a session, guys, three to five times a week, focus on your flexibility, and stretch through all that full motion, you'll have good posture. All those ballet lessons didn't pay off, right? But that's because I became an anthropologist, um, not the ballet dancer. But it'll improve your posture. You'll reduce your risk of injury. There are lots of good reasons to try to get back that flexibility. The fourth type of exercise is balance. Remember, so we got to stand on one foot. Well, walking sideways, walking backwards, testing yourself and making sure that you have your balance doesn't require the gym. You can do these things at home. And if you just do, again, five to 10 exercise sets and mix up your balancing exercises, it can be simple. But your brain is going to be building up all this reserve. You're strengthening your brain as you're walking backwards to the kitchen with a glass of red wine around the neighbor. I don't know. <laughs> but if you don't, if you don't, if you don't practice that balance, then you start to lose it. It really does diminish as we age. So focusing on strength, balance, flexibility. What's the other one, you guys? Aerobics. <laughs> I was just testing myself. Um, the other pillar is mental fitness. So I, I love to show this slide because one of my favorite people in the world is in this slide. Does anybody recognize or know Quincy Jones? That's Quincy Jones down here in the corner. And, and Quincy's 82 now. And he's always my example of mental fitness. He is just killing it at 82, right? But when you think about mental fitness, mental fitness is just as important as physical fitness. And there's lots of different ways to accomplish it. Uh, most importantly, why, why am I talking about mental fitness? Well, we have this thing called cognitive reserve or brain reserve. And what it does is it, your brain has this reserve in place that helps your brain continue to adapt and respond. So it can kind of tap into this reserve as it needs it to resist damage, to resist diseases, to focus on all the things that life throws at it. The brain has this reserve. And as you continue to learn through life and as you embrace new activities or develop new skills, you're building up this reserve. And so it's important that you continue to do this so your brain has something to reach into when it needs it, right? So how do you do that? Well, this is kind of like that eat, pray, love, right? This is play, learn, study. So I can play, I can learn, I can study. Things like crossword puzzles and Sudoku and chess and cards and even the online games, right? I have a teenage son, he's 19 now, and he always talks me into playing these crazy online games with him. He always kills me, so I think there's some kind of Oedipal maternal thing going on there because we play Halo and I'm dead in the first 10 seconds, right? Because I'm trying to figure out where do, where do you push these buttons and where, you know, how do I jump into the tank? I don't know, so I get killed along the way. I'm so sorry about that. But it, what, what does that do? It improves your motor skills. It, it helps you build your brain. It makes you problem solve, but also new hobbies. Learning a new language. There's an incredible study about bilingualism and brain health that just came out from the AAIC conference this week that talks about how, how learning a new language actually continues to um, help your brain grow. Quincy speaks 22 languages. Is that crazy? What musician speaks, you know, speaks 22 languages and why? But it's this constant development, right? Because he traveled everywhere. I was showing off one day because in college I studied Arabic and I thought, oh, I'm so smart. I studied Arabic. And I had the great fortune to sit with Quincy and I was showing off really bad. And I said, here, look how this is how I write my name in Arabic. And I wrote it in Arabic, which is about all I remember from college, by the way, of my Arabic. And then all of a sudden, Quincy writes his name in Arabic with some other big sentence that probably said, Anita, you are so stupid. But, you know, <laughs> but 
but this idea that languages can build your cognitive reserve. Languages can help you know, increase your brain health. That's pretty exciting. Or playing a musical instrument. Another thing that actually contributes to your brain health. So play, learn, have some fun, study, continue to get educated. There's a program here in Las Vegas. I'm sorry, remote locations, but there's a, they may actually be in the remote locations too, I may not know, but it's called the OLLI program. It's the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at UNLV. I highly recommend it. Every semester, I think they teach as many as 70 classes. And I taught one of the classes, and most of the people in the room were 75 and older. And I had a gentleman who was 97 who completed the brain health index score while I was there with no instructions on the computer. And I thought, oh my gosh, Marvin's better than I am, right? But, but it's important to continue that education. And so the correlation between education and continued education and brain health is important. And it's a lot of fun. So if you have a chance, go check out. It's O-L-L-I. Social interaction is also quite important for your brain health. Just staying connected. And you think about it, right? This is an excuse to have fun and talk to people, you guys, and grow your brain health. Who wouldn't do this? So if you, if you think about, um, about the kinds of things you can do to be social, what are, what are some of the things you do? You guys are in clubs, church groups, red, red hats, um, uh, card groups. Do you get together and play cards? You get together and go play bingo. My gosh, if you go, you know, Suncoast Bingo Hall, people are exercising their brains and they're socializing. So the idea of staying connected is so that you have this social network. And the most recent science has said that the people with the most social interaction in the community, they experience the slowest rate of memory decline. Now, I am convinced, at least from my mother's church groups, that that's because everybody's remembering everything about everybody else's lives. <laughs> So they have all these new neural pathways going on every single day. But it's important, right? It's important to have that social support. It's important to be part of something because you feel purpose. And volunteering is another great way to do it. Having a purpose where you're going in and you're tutoring, or you're planting trees, or you're volunteering over at Three Square, or at the Mission, or at Opportunity Village, or here. We have plenty of volunteer opportunities here at the center. Getting up with purpose is so important to your brain. It gives you focus, it gives you vision. And, and for me, the most, the, the most exciting part of this is, you know, you wanna be part of clubs and everything, but the power of pets just goes straight to my heart, right? So those pets can do anything. They can make you feel good, they can calm you down, they can, they can give you a big happy wagon tail and face when you come home, and they just make you feel good. So there's, there's great power of pets, and we have our own pet here, Jordan. His mama's Donna, and Jordan comes in on Wednesdays, I think. Is he out there? And there's this silky Yorkie that in this little, little stroller that's the cutest little dog I've ever seen, but the joy that they bring to people and the joy that you can find in your pet is an important part of being social. So you may think you're going home alone, but if you can be responsible for a pet, I highly encourage having one. Other than my chihuahua, Camacho's a good boy, but he doesn't like too many people. Um, sleep and relaxation. Okay, guys, so sleep and relax. This is my favorite topic because I don't do it well. I mean, I'm worse at this maybe than physical exercise. But sleep is critical. Sleep energizes you, it energizes your brain, it puts you in a better mood. My friends here at work know when I've had less than five hours because I'm grumpy, right? You really need to get at least six hours a night. How many of you get at least six hours a night? Oh, okay, so you guys have to teach me how to do that because it does re-energize you and it gets you and you get up with a positive attitude. You also need to take little breaks during the day. There is a, a, a this, one of my favorite chief um, executive officers in the country is a guy named Herb Kelleher. And Herb was the founder of Southwest Airlines. Have you ever been on Southwest? Those guys sing songs and you don't get the normal emergency procedures. They sing you a song and they dance in the aisles and everybody's happy. 
but what I am most enamored with is not just how Herb leads and directs, but he requires 20 minutes of sleep. So people take little power naps during the day. They shut down their brains. They shut down all of those pieces. And it's that rejuvenation that we sometimes forget to do. Sometimes just a little bit of quiet time, even here at work. Just a little bit of quiet time, a little bit of meditation, a little bit of inward focus. 10 minutes can make all the difference. Does anybody do that? Oh, isn't it great? Right? It makes, when you're, when you're done with it, you're, you're rejuvenated. So just giving your brain a break, because it's not even really on break when you're, when you're going through your meditative state. It's still working on your behalf. It's not just not doing the 30,000 things you try to make it do. And then practicing meditation. There are some great studies around, uh, around yogis and great studies around the practice of yoga that also contribute back. People who meditate are building cognitive reserve and building their brain health. So if you can practice some meditation, you can also fight some of your, you know, the diseases related to age decline. How am I doing on time? Good? Good. Yay. So, great. So food and nutrition. Food and nutrition is uh, the sixth pillar in all of this. And um, food and nutrition is important because it's important to eat smart. Now, here's another parent truism that now I find myself saying, is you are what you eat. Now, there's a little twist on that. You are who you hang out with. You are who you exercise with. But you are what you eat. And a Mediterranean diet really helps you maintain your brain health. So a diet that's rich in leafy greens and fruits and olives and whole grains, all of that Mediterranean diet is good for your body and good for your brain. Now, it's also a Mediterranean lifestyle that kind of goes with it. So it's not just about the fact that you're eating right, but it's about thinking and relaxing and practicing this lifestyle. So I recall the first time that I went to Europe and I was an executive with Chase and I had two weeks of vacation and I was just living large, right? And I'm in Paris and I brag, well, I think I'm bragging, about having two weeks of vacation. And all of my friends in Paris looked at me and said, oh, what a horrible employer you have. And I said, what are you talking about? Two weeks of vacation. Everybody takes six weeks off in Europe. And I'm like, oh, I am moving here tomorrow. But it's a, men it's a mental shift. So it's a mental shift about meditation, about positive lifestyles, and, and not just eating whole grains, but it's living this really well-enriched diet and well-enriched lifestyle. Filling your basket full of all these leafy vegetables, but then filling your life with all of these leafy experiences, right? Going to museums, going to concerts, looking at art, experiencing music, taking time to relax. All of that contributes to your brain health. So that doesn't sound so bad, does it? It sounds like kind of fun things to do that actually help me improve my brain along the way. Um, I, I met another one. This is another funny story. I have anthropologists full of stories. So, uh, and I travel a lot. My, my experiences are to travel whenever I get a chance. I love to travel. Obviously, uh, being the anthropologist, right? But I remember going to Maui, and I was on a sailboat, and I met this guy who was a former Wall Street CEO. And he was captaining this sailboat. And I, so, of course, I had to know, what are you doing, and what are you doing here? And he said, you know, I just needed a lifestyle shift. And I said, well, what are you doing here in Maui? And he said, I'm a firefighter in the rainforest. Now, how many fires could a rainforest possibly have? It rains all the time, right? And I'm thinking, what a great job. I'm going to aspire to be a firefighter in the rainforest in Maui. Oh my gosh, this is perfect. But it's that shift, right? It's going from that crazy shift from craziness to firefighter in the rainforest. And for me, that's always kind of marked that, that continuum of lifestyle. How do you think? What do you do differently? And what are the kinds of goals and visions that you have along the way? OK, I, I got to ask you guys, though, the, what were we making? What was I making tonight? Salmon. Crispy salmon. Crispy salmon? 
Crispy what? Crispy skin salmon. Oh, what well, and what did I need in there? Salmon, butter, 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 butter. I ordered those last two. I hear salmon, butter, Dijon mustard. Dijon mustard. Dijon mustard. Awesome. Very good. You're right. So together, you helped me create my grocery list. I need salmon, and I need butter, and I need lemon, and mustard, and tarragon. Now, that wasn't just a crazy exercise, right? So one of the things I encourage you to do with, to keep your brain moving is to do two things at once. So you might be here listening to me, but you may also be making your grocery list. You could be exercising and reading a book. So make your brain work. Challenge it. Challenge it to do things differently. So I find myself every day driving to work the same old way. Uh, you know, have a routine. I know what time I get up. I know what I do next. And my day is just very laid out. You have to challenge yourself. So my brain, my neural pathways are all just going along this happy little path, getting fat and lazy, right? So challenge it. Make it think differently. I, I was flying from Houston. Uh, to Vegas, and I'm a Texas girl, and every once in a while you'll hear me slide into a Texas thing. But I was flying from Houston to, uh, to Vegas, and I sat next to this woman. And I don't know how many of you have ever been to Houston, but everything in Houston is larger than life, right? Hair is like this big, everything's big. And I sat next to this woman, and she had on a ring that was to die for. I can't tell you. It was huge, and it was on this finger, and I just obsessed. Beautiful, it's so beautiful. I can't believe this is so gorgeous. So finally, I got up the courage and said, Okay, I just have to ask you, you know, where did you get that incredible ring? You know, is there a story? And she said, Oh, honey, it's my engagement ring. So I sat for a minute and, you know, I'm Italian, I'm thinking different hands. And I go, Okay, it's your engagement ring, but you're wearing it on the wrong finger. And she's like, Oh, honey, that's because I married the wrong man. <laughs> and so, <laughs> So the reason I tell you this story is because whenever I think about doing something differently, I think about wearing my rings on the other finger, right? So you need to shift that, make it feel different, take your watch from here and put it over here, um, go to work a different way, go to church a different way, I'm sorry. <laughs> Cook crispy salmon, right? So I, I want to also, in addition to the six pillars of brain health, I want to talk a little bit about this notion of a free brain checkup. Um, the Cleveland Clinic is actually the first organization to offer a self-assessment of your brain health. How many of you are like have a computer or an iPad or a smartphone? Right? Everybody's got something. So we built a, a website called healthybrains.org. And when you go to healthybrains.org, you actually just answer a few questions, a few, I think 50. You answer about 50 questions about yourself and your lifestyle, and it integrates the six pillars. And after you answer those questions, we give you a dashboard. So you answer your questions, and they're really fun questions. And they'll ask you about the Mediterranean diet and about your exercise. And as long as you don't lie to it, you will get what we call a brain health index score. And what that is is a compilation of how you answered those questions, and it gives you a score. And then in each one of the pillars, you'll see another score. So you can see, <laughs> this was mine. So physical, I didn't do very well. I got like a 22, but I didn't lie. Nutrition, I got a score of 65. So there's some improvement in there. And the scale is 0 to 100, like normal, right? And um, medical, I'm fortunate, touch wood, you know, not bunch of serious problems. Um, sleep, I did not do well. <clears throat> but I had to take a call, admittedly, in the middle of the night that kind of ruined my that week, so I answered it wrong. Um, mental, mental health, that's my mental fitness piece. Uh, I, I got a 68. And then social, I wasn't doing so great there, but no excuses. So each of you will have a number in each pillar that lets you know where to focus. So sometimes I think, oh, there's six pillars. I got to do them all at once. In my case, I know I got to focus on that 22. So I need to do the kinds of things that will help me improve my physical exercise scores. And as those go up, so does my brain health index score. So they're all tied together, and they give you a guideline for 
you know, who you are, what you want to be, and, and where you want to go in terms of managing your brain health. So the, you'll get a dashboard, and then you'll get a personal brain health report. And that report will speak to you individually and give you personal tips and recommendations. And if you wear a Fitbit, you can even integrate your steps and all your Fitbit tracking into this dashboard. And what we're hoping is that you'll use this dashboard to manage your brain health. And that it'll give you some numbers to manage to so you're actually guided along the way on what you can do. So before I finish up, I wanted to make sure that you knew about the brain health report. But I also want to share something with you. Because not only can brain health become overwhelming, there are a few things that actually stimulate your brain so much, and they're so much fun for me. Um, and there's two of them, art and music, that I think go way beyond everything else. And there are plenty of studies around musical training and what musical training does to your brain. And for me, I think about music and the transformation of, uh, that can take place. But I also think about the art. So there's a master artist. His name is Vladimir Kush. If you get a chance here in Las Vegas to go over to Caesars or Planet Hollywood and just go through his galleries, your, your senses will be just crazy with all the metaphors that he creates for life. And this is one of my favorite paintings, and I share it with you today because it's thought-provoking. Can you see it? I don't know if you can see it all the way in the back, but oh, you have printouts, right? So what do you see? At first glance, you see a man at a piano with some people listening, right? And then as you look a little deeper and you look inside that grand piano, what do you see? A butterfly. And what's the butterfly generally a metaphor for? Transformation. Transformations. And then as you look a little bit deeper into this picture and you look at the people, they're in cocoons. So they're all wrapped in cocoons and some of them are sprouting wings and some of them are starting to transform. And it's this power of art and music to transform us, to tease our brains. Right? We could spend probably a whole session just decomposing works that make our brains think. So as you look at pieces like this, and as you think about pieces like this, and you think about the transformative capabilities of art and music, think about how easy that is to go walk over to a gallery and spend an hour in there and let your brain exercise a little bit. Look at those paintings, see what they are, and, and talk about them. Take your friends, go see what that's like, and then you might catch a concert too along the way, right? But this painting is called Moonlight Sonata, and, and for me, it really does speak to brain health more than anything. There are a few others I left for you on your chairs, but this one, really speaks to my heart and soul about how if you just indulge a little bit in music and a little bit in art, then um, you could transform yourself. And whether you're 18, which is my son on the right, or you're 81 and you're Quincy, you're making memories, right? So they're making memories. It doesn't matter whether you're 18 or 81. You, too, can be improving your brain health and working together. On Saturday, I finished a, a, a training like this, a presentation like this, and I had this incredible pleasure to speak to a group of female philanthropists, and their organization is called PEO. And um, we shared ideas, and there was a woman there, her name is Lori, so I'm gonna share Lori's story. And at the end of it, everybody always says, oh my gosh, there's six pillars, where do I start? And I say, go to the website, and you know, get your brain check up, it's a good way to start. And Lori said, I know exactly how to start. I'm like, great, how do you start? And she said, you get mad. And I'm like, get mad? What did I do in this presentation that made you mad? And she said, no, 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 no. Look, Anita, it's music, art, and dance. They're the three things that can contribute nicely to your brain. You can make memories, you can enjoy yourself, and at the same time, get mad and make sure that your brain is doing little sit-ups in its head. And I thought, you know, I couldn't conclude better than the, what Lori had to say. So I steal her theme. I openly say it was Lori. But I encourage all of you, start simply and just go out and get mad, right? So I thank you. That's the six pillars of brain health. I think if you, um, you have guidelines in front of you, do you have any questions that I can answer for you? 
He does. My um, son is, is 18. He's got a unique story. He um, started out as a geek. He built computers. He took them apart. He was very engineering focused. Never talked to anybody. Barely, you know, the, that little kind of audiovisual guy who just builds computers and is really quiet. And one day he came to me about three years ago and said, Mommy, I want to try out for the school musical. And my heart stopped, and I thought, oh, I can't break his heart. He, and I said, Tommy, you know you have to speak in front of a lot of people if you do a school musical, and you barely talk to me. And he said, no, Mom, it's in me. I just know it's in me. So the courageous mother that I am, I have a sister who's an actor, so I called her and said, Rosie, you need to break it to Tommy because I can't do this and break his heart. You need to do it. And <laughs> he'll forgive you later. So my sister auditioned him, basically. And he has a beautiful voice. Who knew? And um, so he auditioned for the play. And he, um, for the last three years, has been performing. Mr. Ruvo became his mentor about a year and a half ago when he saw him at a charity. And, um, and he has, he plays, he taught himself piano. He taught himself guitar. He's working on horns now. And, and it's all about this sort of brain growth. And, um, we are very fortunate. Quincy actually signed him um, to, uh, under a management deal. So Quincy Jones is now his manager. Yeah, it's, it's really great. And so, um, but, but I always look to him. So sometimes, you know how the kid becomes the parent, right? So he's very good about music, and he's very good about art, and he's so philanthropic. And all of the things that we teach in the six pillars, he does kind of naturally. And I think that's a good thing, right? So my dashboard, my goal with my dashboard is to become more like my son. And maybe, maybe, who knows, I'll sit down at a piano and I'll entertain all of you guys next year. But I think that that's an important part of it. Musical instruments, listening to music, turning it on, just sit at home, turn on your stereos and walk backwards around the kitchen, drink a glass of wine and make a five ingredient dinner, right? So any, any other questions, Susan? How about the remote locations? Um, I'm, I didn't mean to leave you out. Do you have any questions there? So, so did you guys hear the question? I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. She was at a conference, and one of the papers and one of the scientists said that excessive multitasking now could lead to, um, to cognitive decline in the future. I, I am not personally familiar with that paper, but I'm thinking that excessive multitasking could be, tied, could be linked to stress. And I always talk about how I could be doing everything really, really right, but then the stress factor comes in and just negates everything that I have done. But I will go look at that. I'm not saying that you need to do 35 things at once. I'm just saying challenge your brains so that you may be doing two things at once. Um, but I will go check that. I will go look at that paper and see about the excessive one. I, I, what we say here at the Cleveland Clinic is everything in moderation. So whether that is tasking, multitasking, or um, having a glass of wine, you do, or even food and nutrition, you have to do it all in moderation. You don't want to run out today and go get your gym membership and work out like crazy tonight. You want to do it all in moderation until you start raising the bar. And, and with your brain, it's the same thing, raising your bar on your brain and challenging it to do a little more. Uh, maybe it's just doing a couple of languages. Or maybe it is as simple as doing my grocery list while I'm walking. So do everything in moderation. And thank you for sharing that paper. I will go take a look and see if I can find it. That's great to share. Anybody else? Sir? Uh, 
uh, again, back to the moderation piece. Oh, I'm sorry, there, I'm repeating, let me repeat the question. So um, if physical exercise is most important and aerobic is really important part of that physical exercise, how do you do it when you're 91? 91? Yeah, no, I, you said when you're 91, right? 90 to 100. So um, again, what's important with that is keeping it in moderation and staying active. So when you look at your activity levels, they are adjusted by age. So the target heart rate when you're 90 to 100 is a much lesser target heart rate than it is when you're 57 or 60. So it comes down considerably and it's adjusted based on age. At the same time, the most important part of that is to stay active. So you may cut back a little on your aerobics, but you may be working a little bit more on balance. But to just keep moving, the sedentary lifestyle is what's bad for you. So you try to hit those targets. That's the, uh, the heart rate. So what about the 30 minutes a day? Well, 30 minutes a day, that could be walking. And, and the evidence is that it takes about 30 minutes a day for each session. But maybe you do two 15-minute sessions, or maybe you do a 10-minute session in the morning, a 10-minute in the afternoon, and a 10-minute at the evening, just to keep you know, walking around. It, my, my mom was 84, and she would walk around the house. And so she would you know, try to build her 10 minutes in, a little bit at 10 minutes, and she'd rest, and then the afternoon she'd get in some more. So part of that is just how you break it up, and the fact that you stay active keeps your brain moving. Yes? No, I'm not. They offer a lot of classes that are really cheap. I go to Phoenix Yoga. Yoga is cheap. Where is this? It's at Mountain View. It's oh. all the big hospitals. It's yep. HCU program. It costs $20 a year to join. They have all sorts of classes, okay. and they're right around the so, so that's great. So let me share this with everybody. There's a program at Mountain View. It's called HTU program. Well, HTU is not just Mountain View. It's oh, it's Sunrise. Oh. So look for a program called HTU that offers classes, seniors classes. Um, it offers yoga classes and offers probably some fitness classes. They do free blood pressure and, screening. Oh, that's great. And stuff like that. So you could go there, you can get free BMI, free blood screening. So I'm assuming if they just do a Google search, it may say HTU or search online or call one of the. H and then two and the letter. Okay, so it's H like the letter, two like the number, and U like the letter. So um, I would check those out. Do I have any other questions? Yes? Yes, we have another question of Param. OK, Param. Um, the question is, is grape juice as good as red wine? And is there a sp specific variety of red wine that is better than others? Um, I am sorry to say that I don't know if there's a specific variety of red wine that's better than the others. Um, there is, um, uh, uh, the deeper the color, generally speaking, the better it is for you, but I don't know that if a Chianti is better than a Cabernet for you. Um, and as long as it has the Revesterol, then um, that's what you're getting out of the red wine itself. And you had a question? Yes. I personally like to walk because I like to be outside, but if you're getting on a treadmill, congratulations. Yeah, absolutely. You want to stay active. Again, you target your heart rate based on your age, and so you want to get your heart rate to those levels. Yes. So it's 200. There's a formula in there that's you just take 220 minus your age and then take that times 80%, and that's the general rule for your target heart rate. Oh, I see. I didn't know that. I, I didn't know it either until I started here. Yep, watch. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh, I would never guess you were 80. Everybody in here looks so young. Oh my gosh. Yes?
my inspiration. If I can be as active and as well put together as she is at her age, God love her. Yeah. I, I, I want to I be that one too. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you for joining us. We have some handouts, and um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. But stay healthy, stay sharp, you guys. Thanks. Thank you.